Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Dimitrios Kostopoulos, and I am the co-founder of Hands-On Seminars, and I'm delighted to welcome uh, all of you tonight uh, in this uh, uh, amazing uh, webinar uh, with uh, uh, Dr. L Dr. Leon Chato as uh, a guest. Um, but uh, uh, before we start, I would like to find out a little bit uh, uh, from you uh, where uh, you are um, uh, logging in uh, from tonight. So if um, everyone uh, real quick answer this question online, you can just click and let us know if you are um, logging in from the U.S., from South America, from Africa, from Europe, or from any other place uh, around the world. So a couple of more answers to go. I'd like everybody to uh, participate. That's great. And it seems that uh, we have 38% um, uh, of you um, are joining us uh, from um, uh, the US. Um, nobody from South America tonight. Uh, and 8% uh, from Africa, 15% from Europe, and 38% from other places around the world. So uh, we have to, you can certainly type in uh, in the uh, chat box where exactly you are um, uh, logging in from so we know. Uh, and also please uh, answer this question whether you are a PT or a PTA, an occupational therapist or an OTA, a medical doctor or a, a DO, uh, an ATC or a massage therapist or any other professional. <clears throat> Okay, and I am closing this poll, and it seems that tonight uh, uh, we have uh, uh, mostly, um, oops, uh, we have mostly uh, PTs and uh, PTAs with us. So, um, again, thank you all for uh, uh, joining us. Uh, uh, as I said tonight, uh, we have with us uh, uh, Dr. Leon uh, uh, Chato, uh, who uh, will be uh, discussing with us a very, very uh, important uh, uh, topic uh, on uh, uh, positional release, um, on positional release uh, uh, therapy. Sorry about that. I am uh, having a little trouble with my screen. Okay, we're back now. Um, I, I would like to mention that uh, uh, Dr. Chato, um, besides being a world-known uh, naturopath, osteopath, and acupuncturist in the UK, he is also the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Bodywork and Movement Therapies, and it is actually uh, the Journal of Bodywork and Movement Therapies is the official journal of hands-on seminars. And I will invite all of you to uh, go to the handsonseminars.com website and subscribe for um, the uh, journal. But also, if you are an MCMT, uh, MCMT student or graduate, you are receiving um, as complimentary from Hands On Seminars your first uh, year of subscription completely free of charge. And subsequently, you can... Um, you can uh, continue subscribing to the journal at a very low uh, uh, price. Um, and uh, with uh, uh, no further delay, I would like to uh, go ahead and um, introduce you to Dr. Chato, who will discuss with us tonight the very interesting topic of positional... Party me. Okay. Leon, you are on. Okay, um, good evening, and let me put my slides on the screen and clear the screen. I don't know, Dimitri, can you tell me whether that is uh, yes. showing it, adequately? Yes, it's uh, fantastic. We can we can see your screen. That's perfect. Okay, so let me let me take you through this topic, which um, I find 
to be one of the most exciting aspects of uh, manual therapy, where which it has emerged out of a background of osteopathy. Part of the methodology goes way back to the beginning of osteopathy, but much of it has evolved in, in the last 30, 40 years, and mainly in the States. Um, if we look at uh, the main forms of positional release methodology, they can be divided up into what can be called functional methodology, where the tissues are joint or soft tissues are um, eased, moved, folded, gently taken into what is considered by the practitioner based on palpation um, a position of comfort, uh, ease, um, relaxation, where um, hypertonic tissues are um, eased into uh, a state of comfort and support where some form of possibly neurological, possibly circulatory, we're not sure of the, me the mechanisms, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, um, changes occur and quite dramatic modification in, in function uh, occurs. Um, that model, the functional approach, we practice in the workshops, um, and it, it, it's not difficult to learn, but it's not, uh, in, in areas where you have good control over the the structures, small joints or um, possibly the cervical area. But in the main, the, uh, the other method that is, uh, is most used and the one that we spend a lot of time on is a modified form of strain counter strain where tissues again are taken into an ease position um, based on feedback from the patient. So an area of sensitivity, a tender area is, is, is identified usually in hypertonic structures the patient is asked to provide feedback uh, in terms of uh, a numerical um, feedback. So if I find something in a soft tissue that is uncomfortable, I ask the person to grade that for the purpose of the exercise as a 10. And we gently, following particular protocols which are um, well established, take the tissues towards what would be um, uh, reported back as a score of three or less. So we start with a 10, get down to a three, and in, in essence, whether you're using the functional approach where you're guiding the tissues into a comfort position um, based on your palpation skills, or whether you're using feedback from the patient, um, you're, you're going to end up in much the same place. A degree of facilitation, that's the third item on the screen, uh, involves adding either a compressor or a distraction or a shear force to the tissues, which makes them even more comfortable. Now, all of this sounds, if you're unfamiliar with it, a little bit odd. But um, if, let me take you through uh, other variations, um, which often involve exaggerating any existing distortion. So that if something is hypertonic and short, the ease position is actually going to um, hold it in an even shorter, unloaded position. Um, often, the ease position is a replication of a strain position. Something happens when you're flexing and the ease position, um, or some, that something might uh, result in a back pain or a hip or sacroiliac type pain. The ease position is going to be um, virtually a replication of that position but uh, in a supported position. Um, that you can also work from prescriptions uh, which is uh, very much the Jones uh, counter strain, strain counter strain model which we uh, look at, but we, we believe we've found much more um, simple ways of identifying ease. And um, going through this little list, uh, the, you can see that there are different ways of, of ending up in more or less the same place. Uh, that is that ease position. You can use palpation, or you can use um, patient discomfort as a guide, or you can add facilitation, or the methods uh, known as mobilization with movement, the New Zealand um, Mulligan approach um, has uh, echoes of position release, has elements of it, or taping which unloads tissues, um, McKenzie methods where movements are in directions of comfort rather than anything that exacerbates pain, and in sacro-occipital technique in chiropractic using um, blocks for support. All of those are variations on the theme of positional release. And um, these images 
um, this uh, this one which um, I'm circling with the little uh, cursor is uh, a strain counter strain model where a tender point is being monitored and the arm is being positioned until the pain disappears from that tender point. Um, Mulligan's work uses um, glide of uh, uh, joint surfaces, actually joint play as a means of achieving something similar. McKenzie methods move patients into uh, their comfort or ease positions which don't which reduce um, pain. Uh, taping can unload tissues. Sacral occipital technique uses blocks. So there are variations on that theme. Um, there are a number of others uh, which are listed here. They're all based on uh, traditional osteopathic methodology, stills technique or balanced ligamentous tension or fascial unwinding, uh, variations on a theme um, which are uh, all relying on that uh, ease position which is found in different, different ways. Uh, Jones, Lawrence Jones, um, uh, osteopathic physician, identified uh, multiple points on the body which he regarded as uh, useful in easy or monitoring points for treatment of particular joint areas. This is a, a, a superb model, but it requires memorizing literally dozens, if not hundreds, of uh, different um, points on the body. And we find in uh, the in the modified version that we we teach that this is quite unnecessary, and uh, this is a sort of uh, complicating factor which can be avoided if you use a particular formulation for identifying movements that are painful or movements that are restricted and then targeting the, uh, the soft tissues that are potentially re restraining free movement or being uh, pain generators. And within those soft tissues, uh, localized areas of um, pain or dysfunction will be identified and used as that monitor as you position tissues into ease and a resolution um, of, or a partial or total resolution of the dysfunction occurs. Um, so the objective of all of the methods, the key objective, is to restore tissues to normal physiological function. And uh, tender points are used. It's useful to just uh, talk about tender points. These are not necessarily trigger points. Anything that is tender that shouldn't be tender is potentially useful as a monitor. And that's used as a guide to positioning um, three-dimensionally in flexion, side bending, rotation, shear, translation, and so on, um, to identify positions of maximum comfort. And that can be the terminology there. You'll see the word ease or dynamic neutral. Um, these are all, or comfort. These are all potentially the same thing. Starting with a score of 10, reducing by at least 70%, adding a facilitating compression, and then um, maintaining that position for um, a short period uh, before gently releasing. A functional technique here is, is illustrated here uh, in this rather um, ambitious, shall we say, illustration, where um, palpating hand, this listening hand, is uh, assessing tissue responses to movements of, as illustrated by the arrows, interflexion, extension, side flexion, rotation, shear, uh, forces, translation, um, and extension, compression, and so on. And in each of those positions, there will be tissue changes palpated, and one position of comfort is stacked onto another until a maximum uh, position is identified, and that is held as, and then changes start to occur in those tissues. Same thing can be done, perhaps, for example, in a shoulder joint or any joint that you can control and monitor during positioning. Um, there are studies. These are a couple of studies listed here, 89 and then 2005, looking at the use of these methods post-operatively uh, to um, enhance um, tissue healing, where the you cannot, you can't see it clearly here, but this, um, where the uh, cursor is moving, this arrow, uh, this is an arm, and that hand would be underneath the patient between the shoulder blades. This hand is on the chest. Let's say this being um, sternotomy, and there's scar tissue here. 
and each hand would identify directions of movement of comfort of skin on fascia and superficial fascia on underlying tissue, and that would be held. These methods um, uh, enhance healing quite dramatically, and these studies um, uh, demonstrate that the hemodynamic changes that occur following this sort of um, very gentle manipulation, which actually starts with a patient very soon after, after surgery. Um, a very similar method is known as integrated neuromuscular release, where here the patient is seated. Each hand would independently identify directions of comfort, moving uh, superiorly, inferiorly, laterally and med medially, rotation, rotating clockwise and anticlockwise, and for each hand finding um, a combined position of comfort, which the patient um, uh, would, would only have, have a sense of. These are all uh, assessed by direct palpation from the um, practitioner. And a, a useful study here showing um, benefit, uh, in, this is a 2003 study, um, in tissue responses to, uh, hypertonic uh, uh, tissue responses to this sort of uh, gentle um, uh, approach. Uh, direct um, use of uh, Translation uh, in the cervical area can uh, can do something very similar, working on the um, you, the mechanisms involved in spinal coupling, so that as joints are translated gently, uh, one direction may feel more restricted than the other. The tissues of the uh, segment is taken in the direction of um, most ease and held, and after 30 to 60 seconds, um, a degree of normality is is identified. Uh, subsequently. So we actually use this in, as a workshop exercise. It's also be, uh, an extremely useful clinical model um, for sensitive cervical areas, uh, especially post-traumatic or during recovery from uh, injuries such as whiplash. Uh, a functional uh, method of treating atlanto-occipital joint uh, is illustrated here where all directions of movement are uh, introduced. Right, with this palpating hand, uh, sensing tissue response at the atlanto-occipital area during different directions of movement. And uh, subsequently, a combined position of, of, of ease is identified and held. And um, uh, that's another one of the workshop exercises we do. And this is an extremely profoundly relaxing and useful way of uh, easing atlanto-occipital dysfunction. Um, there are a number of studies showing um, animal um, position release. Uh, the sort of injury that, that um, jumping uh, horses can, uh, can uh, experience in some of the studies where the thermal, thermal imaging is used pre and post um, uh, position release, uh, the results are outstanding. They measure also the horse's stride length before and after treatment. Uh, this is a position release um, of the atlanto-occipital area, cervical complex. Horses are extremely obliging. So anyone who works with animals can use position release extremely effectively. Um, uh, uh, Aaron, have, uh, um, so, so sorry for uh, interrupting you. just want to make it a little bit more interactive, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I, I, I want to find the opportunity to ask you, uh, in terms of the response of uh, uh, the muscle, uh, do you find a difference um, uh, in the in the in the timing of the response, or the way uh, the, the the feeling of the response of the muscle uh, between uh, humans and and other animals that you that you have seen or, or treated, or uh, or in between the different species of animals, any different? Well, I, my, my experience with animals, uh, Dimitri, is, is limited to, um, to dogs and cats. I haven't treated horses, but I, know I have colleagues who have. Right. Uh, and my, my understanding of uh, treating horses is that the response is re relatively quick and that um, horses seem to uh, assist in the process. They move if, as you see in the illustration on the uh, top left here, Correct. Um, the, uh, the practitioner is both palpating and feeling. The, the horse seems, uh, feeling the, the tissue response, the horse seems to be um, 
helping, assisting in the movement. There's no sort of force used. The, the horse will automatically move into an ease position. What the practitioner is trying to do there is support it Correct. And, and help it. Uh, my, my experience with dogs is that they respond um, usually, except for one bad temper chihuahua that I, I don't want to talk about, but otherwise most dogs do seem to be extremely responsive. Um, if, I, if I palpate um, uh, tension in a neck. Now, I don't treat dogs as a, professionally. This would be uh, outside my scope of practice, but I have to, uh, treated our own and friends' dogs um, just because this is such a simple thing to do. You can do it without anyone knowing you're doing it. You, right, uh, right. You're, you're feeling the, 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 the neck or the spine and gently, gently moving into a comfort position. You certainly know when, you, when you're moving away from that ease position the dog will be restless and the dog will not be happy. But in, in a comfort position, the tissue response is quite, is quite rapid. 30, 60 seconds if you can, uh, uh, is a norm uh, there. Thank so, you. But I, as to horses, I give this as an illustration. Um, there's a chapter in, in, the, uh, in the, my positional release book by um, osteopathic practitioners who work with horses. And that's... Uh, I just find it fascinating. They also talk about they, there are illustrations that they've sent me working on various uh, zoo animals. There's one working working on an elephant, I, I, where there are four practitioners working on it at the same time. Quite remarkable. But the, the what I, what I'd say is as an example of um, I don't know if there's a placebo effect when you're treating an animal. There may well be, but I I find it hard to believe if a horse's stride length improves and you see a circulatory improvement with thermal imaging um, in, a, in a horse that's been traumatized, I think it's fairly clear that something very positive is happening physiologically. Correct. Thank you. So the, the, me the, me the mechanisms uh, that are hypothesized on neurological and circulatory that by various people uh, coming up with models, there's very little evidence. We'll see some evidence in a minute of of um, recent research which does give a, a different clue. Spindle resetting uh, is, a, is a, a model. Changes in hysteresis, uh, the um, density or the tension or if you like the uh, lack of elasticity in connective tissue, uh, that's a very recent study and we'll have a quick look at that a little bit later. Um, changes in pain uh, sensitivity, um, Paul Stanley in, at the University of Arizona Medical School um, has found on the uh, cellular changes, um, fibroblast morphology changes during um, position release uh, in, a, in a laboratory model. And Solomonoff from U University of Colorado talks about uh, ligamentous reflexes when we add distracting or compression forces. So there are a number of different models, um, all of which may be correct or, not, or none of them. Um, they all make sense in a way, and I'm sure somewhere in that cocktail we have an answer, but I don't think there's anything definitive yet. Um, the, the, this is just a study which showed uh, EMG changes with positional release, uh, patients with chronic uh, cervical, cervical dysfunction uh, re received uh, positional release of the upper trapezius for 90 seconds, twice weekly for five weeks, and there were very positive changes um, uh, as an outcome there. Um, Hysteresis, which the definition is basically the rate at which connective tissue responds to loading or unloading. This was a very recent study um, that we're going to see in a moment, uh, which was done, um, I think it was done at the University of Philadelphia, yes, College of Osteopathic Medicine, Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. So they, they used this uh, durometer, which gave a piezoelectric um, impulse to different, uh, to each uh, cervical segment to measure the current uh, response to that particular load. Um, they then treated um, in uh, the, these cervical segments using either muscle energy, counter strain, balanced ligamentous tension, or high velocity manipulation. Um, the, they, they, they measured, the, uh, they, the, they used the term motoricity to represent the overall dysfunction of a segment, and it, it includes mobility and the length of the curve and fixation. So somehow they're measuring change, and they found that strain counter strain produced the greatest overall change in tissue behavior. Um, that's the counter strain um, bar there. All of them produced change other than sham, which produced no change. 
Um, and the study here, which um, involved 240 patients, or not patients, students, palpated for cervical and articular somatic dysfunction, and they used um, those particular techniques, having used a durometer to measure myofascial structures um, with this piezoelectric impulse. So, counter strain resulted in the most significant change, which is interesting because that's one of the models that we're going to be teaching at the workshop. And um, one we won't be teaching is balanced ligamentous tension, but that is another form of positional release. But that's a different study in and of itself. Uh, one of the models that may be um, involved here is mechanotransduction, and we don't have time to discuss this in depth here. Mechanotransduction is the way cells respond to load. And um, this is a, an example of it um, from Paul Stanley's research. Um, they, these are fibroblast cells. This is the, this is the control um, model. They took uh, these uh, fibroblasts and they spread them over a rubber dome, um, an elasticized dome, which was in a vacuum chamber. And then they were subjected to eight hours of repetitive mo motion strain as, as they were um, flexed and extended. That rubber dome was moved up and down solidly for eight hours. Um, you can see fairly dysfunctional uh, damaged, moth-eaten looking cells here, and there, there were a number of inflammatory products being produced. Um, then after 60 seconds of counter strain, where all that was done was that rubber dome was held in a slightly compressed form, exactly equivalent uh, to a model of what would be done in, a, in the human body. And the inflammatory products uh, reduced, and um, fibroblasts became far more um, coherent. So it doesn't prove anything, but it gives a sense of what might be happening as cells um, modify in, in structure their behavior changes. And uh, the, the counter strain uh, model, the positional release model, may be offering a, uh, a degree of coherence and uh, support which allows more normal function to, to be restored. That's the, that's the concept anyway. Um, and then uh, another study of the, on this, using the same idea, uh, and the quotes here um, are um, are useful. The, I look at the, let's just look at this lower one. Human fibroblasts respond to strain by secreting inflammatory cytokines, undergoing hyperplasia, altering cell shape and alignment. Tissue changes, whether resulting from injury, somatic dysfunction, or osteopathic manipulative therapy, soft tissue manipulation, such as strain counter strain affects range of motion, pain, and local inflammation. On a cellular level and in, in a laboratory, we can hypothesize that this is what's happening in the human body. Um, this is just a, uh, a reminder. Solomonoff notes that when ligaments, ligaments are held in a slack position, which is what happens in, for example, strain counter strain, here we have piriformis being monitored, a tender point there, and the ease that that's uncomfortable at the start, scoring a 10, um, or, or not the patient's report of a 10, but the patient told to score it as a 10. And then with a degree of uh, abduction and uh, external rotation and long axis compression, which would load the ligaments and slacken them, um, that tenderness vanishes and subsequently more, uh, improved function. And Solomonoff hypothesizes that the, that ligamentous slackening is what produces the a reflex effect and um, enhanced function. And these are just selected studies. We, we can't look at them all, but just um, effective strain counter strain on pain and strength of hip musculature, strain counter strain treatment of patients with low back pain, stretch reflex and Hoffman reflex response, uh, that is with strain counter strain in subjects with Achilles tendinitis, myofascial pain unresponsive to standard treatment, successful use of strain counter strain, Comparison between the immediate effects of manual pressure release and strain counter strain on latent trigger points in upper trapezius. Uh, strain counter strain treatment of quantitative sensory measures at digitally tender points in the low back. And headache treated by positional release. Um, complex regional pain being treated uh, using strain counter strain. Um, another one here is uh, counter strain in uh, plantar fasciitis. This is an um, application of strain counter strain in upper trapezius um, tender point. 
this is, these were studies back in the 90s on um, sacroiliac uh, tender points. Low back pain, treatment of forward and backward sacral torsion using counter strain. Uh, similar uh, counter strain techniques. These were the same group at the University at um, Texas uh, College of Osteopathic Medicine. Uh, this is looking at tr masseter tr trigger points comparing neuromuscular technique and strain counter strain. Uh, this is an uh, elastography image of normal tissue. That's the trigger point in the dense area and uh, the idea that you can image the before and after and see that the thing changes using various techniques. You could use dry needling, you could use neuromuscular technique, but positional release strain counter strain is probably the most gentle approach and it has the same benefit. This is an Indian study where uh, strain counter strain is used as part of a trigger point deactivation, efficacy of integrated neuromuscular inhibition technique in trapezius trigger points. And this was, um, uh, this methodology we, we practice in the workshop uses strain counter strain as part of the protocol. And that's my dog and that's the end of the presentation. So I'll put myself on the screen for a moment and uh, see if I can, that's not me. That's me. So um, I'm happy to deal with questions um, and anything that you can uh, ask me, I'll be happy to try and answer. That was a fairly quick gallop through the, um, the, 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 the idea of position release. And for those of you unfamiliar with it, I hope it's just given you a sample. What's and let me tell everybody that you were kind enough uh, tonight to be joining us from the UK uh, where we have quite a few hours of difference. Uh, so thank you for doing that. And I'm going to actually unmute the mic of Amanda Meglio. Uh, Amanda, you, you have a question. You are on the air. Go ahead. I didn't ask a question. I didn't say that I have one. Okay, very good. I, 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 but, I'll, but I do have one. I wanted to know about strain counter strain and stretching afterwards. What uh, you believe yes. the importance is of it. Okay, it depends what you're treating there. Um, the, we use, in that protocol for trigger points, um, we use strain counter strain uh, as an intermediate step towards local stretching. So we would um, put tissues into an, an ease position and in that ease position uh, depending upon the sensitivity of the patient, we might hold that for 20, 30 seconds and then using that folded state have an isometric contraction surrounding the trigger point. So we get a very local focused isometric contraction which we th and we then use that as the lead into some local stretching. But not everything needs stretching but where stretching is used, um, uh, position release or strain counter strain can be a precursor to the, st the stretch or it can be used afterwards to calm things down if there, there's been some degree of uh, irritation or discomfort as a result of the stretching. So it, it's, it's something, I don't think I would ever give a position release treatment. It would be part of um, an integrated methodology I think and that's, that's how I would tend to use it. I hope that answers your question. Um, and uh, uh, whoever else has a question, you can type it uh, or you can click on the raise hand feature and uh, I will unmute your mic so you can ask the question. However, we do have a question here uh, from uh, Mariana. She says, uh, have you done strain counter strain uh, when there is muscle soreness after, after extreme eccentric exercise and how? Well, the, the, it's always, the, the how is, uh, is not difficult to answer. The answer is yes, I have. And um, anything that is uncomfortable that shouldn't be uncomfortable, you can find localized areas which are more sensitive uh, than others. Those are simply, um, in, let's put it this way, in traditional Chinese medicine, in acupuncture methodology, there are the so-called Ashi points, points that are sensitive that are not on the, on the meridian maps. And these um, spontaneously tender points are, in, uh, in acupuncture, they become, uh, if you like, honorary acupuncture points and, can be and they can be needled. In strain counter strain, um, in the modified version that, uh, that I teach, the, anything that is tender that shouldn't be tender becomes um, a potential monitoring point for ease, uh, for being placed into ease. And, um, it, whether you're treating something that is 
uh, chronically uh, dis uncomfortable or acutely uncomfortable. The same, um, same rules apply. You simply find, identify one, two or three local areas of, uh, of tenderness and use, using the protocols that we teach, um, you crowd the tissues, fold the tissues, hold them at ease. Without creating any additional discomfort, um, you then um, hold them until uh, a certain amount of time has passed, 30, 60, 90 seconds maybe, or until you feel um, a spontaneous change in the tissue behavior. And uh, so it's, it's irrelevant whether it's acute or chronic. The likelihood is that you're going to get a much more um, rapid and um, lasting change in, a, in an acute setting than you are in a chronic setting, where there may be fibrosis and other tissues that can't just let go. But where you have hypertonicity, for whatever reason, that you can change. Very good. And uh, if anyone else has a question, um, you can either type it now real quick. Um, uh, do you have uh, <laughs> um, uh, an another person is asking, do you have, um, 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 uh, what happens if it is very painful in the beginning? Uh, and also, um, just answer that and I'll ask you the other one we have from Robert. Well, the, if tissues themselves are very painful, yes. then well, there's almost always, you know from the McKenzie model of um, movement into um, ease or movement into, uh, into comfort, directions of movement that are more acceptable to the tissues and some which are not. Usually, almost always, making tissues shorter, somehow supporting and holding them and crowding them, makes them more comfortable. And that would be the, um, the model. If, they, if you're dealing with something, for example, on the anterior uh, thorax. Um, if I found something uh, sensitive and extremely tender here, the methodology would involve some degree of flexion, some degree of uh, rounding and folding towards it. Uh, if that was in the intercostal space or sub, uh, sub um, just below the clavicle, somewhere in that sort of uh, area, then I, I might be monitoring the point with one hand holding the patient in, in, in a crowded position, adding some degree of compression, and the, the sensitivity would vanish while I was holding it in that position. If you think about it, this is very similar to what um, some forms of taping do, just holding the tissues in a folded or shortened position, which is, uh, which is comfortable. And um, so the degree of sensitivity um, initially should be reduced by using the protocols we have for positioning and that's almost always the case. Okay, let me uh, go on and ask because we have a lot more questions so let's get the question from Robert. Uh, what is the difference between your applications of strain, counter strain and Jones or Sharon Weiselfish? Um, I don't know a lot about uh, Sharon's work. I've read a little bit of it. The Jones model uh, in initially um, he discovered this quite um, accidentally on a patient, this whole idea that there was an area of tenderness which he could position and it would help to resolve, um, uh, in, the, in the initial case, a chronic back problem. Um, what has evolved since then is a, a, um, a build-up of, um, how can I put it, a formulaic approach where if you have um, a particular strain uh, of any any area of the body, there are formulae from the Jones Institute which describe which points to use, what positions to use, uh, and you end up with charts which can cover your wall and fill your head, just like an acupuncture map. Um, every part of the body prescribed points, and I try to work by uh, deconstructing that, that model, and uh, it's not myself, M many others have worked on, uh, in a similar way, by deconstructing to the point where you simply go with what the tissues are telling you. Where is the discomfort? If a patient tells me, um, uh, raising my arm and, and stretching backwards hurts me, I ask myself what muscles might be restraining that movement or what muscles would perform the opposite movement, and it's going to be something in this area, and I'm going to find, do a very gentle and rapid palpation, find something tender, 
patient would obviously not be sitting up, it would be probably re reclining, side lying or whatever, or sit or seated. And having found something tender, there could well be five or six or seven or eight possibilities. Find something that's more tender than it ought to be, and then positioning. I don't need the maps, I just need to know which tissues are dysfunctional. What is hurting, what movement is hurting it, not where it hurts, but what movement is hurting it, or what movement is restricting. From there, you have a, a rapid um, insight as to where to start looking. And palpation can take three or four or five or ten seconds. You find something that's unnaturally tender, position it, maybe find something else, and that's all you need to do in most cases. You don't need uh, complex formulae. Uh, I hope that answers. Thank you. Uh, Gavin, in, uh, Gavin is asking, uh, um, let me see, in uh, what case would you hold the tissue in a shortened position versus applying pressure in a state of ease? Um, there, there are uh, situations, let me, let me try and uh, rationalize that. Um, there are advantages in adding ischemic compression um, to, in, some, in some situations, or what's known in, in osteopathic uh, terminology as inhibitory pressure. Um, but in the main, we, we use uh, for the, uh, strength, the counter strain methodology that I'm teaching, we find that uh, having found something sensitive, it could be a trigger point or simply something tender, and positioning into ease, the, the maintenance of compression is not necessary. Uh, one would probably maintain touch. Let's go back to this one that I pretended to find here. Having found it, pressed it sufficiently to register that it's uncomfortable, positioned it until the score has gone down to a three or so, I don't maintain pressure, I maintain contact. So because what has been shown in some studies is that a shift of one or two degrees from that position and the tissues will uh, fire up again. So. If I'm going to stay there for 90 seconds, I don't want 90 seconds of compression. Um, but I want maybe every 15, 20 seconds, just a little, is it still um, easy? Or is it still pain-free? Or, or some such question to the patient. Um, I can't think of where I would want to maintain ease and compression at the same time for any length of time. Um, perhaps the, the questioner can, can elaborate a bit on that question. Um, let me see. Uh, actually, that's that's all uh, it has been asked with that. Uh, I'm, okay. I'm going to go on to the next because we have a lot of questions and I want to make sure that with short answers we get to, <laughs> to as many people as possible. Okay. okay. Um, would you be able to take us through an example of locked forward flexion by John? So someone is locked in flexion. Uh, let's go back to the example I tried to give you. So let's just say uh, my wrist is locked in flexion. Okay, so here we have someone who is in anti-flexion. But let's pretend it's, it's the wrist and not the, fall, not the, the whole body. Um, what are the movements that are going to be uncomfortable? Well, the person won't be able to stand up straight, or if they try to stand up straight, there's going to be pain. So my question to the patient would be, show me what hurts or show me what you can't do. And they can't do this because it either hurts or it's restricted. I'm going to find in the shortened structures one, two, or three areas of tenderness and position accordingly. Um, if it's, let's say this is the front of the, um, of the, of the body, well, let's just take it as a forearm and a, and a wrist. We don't have to think, think of this as the whole body. Um, if I can't extend the wrist easily, there's going to be shortening in the flexor muscles. I will palpate, find something that seems hypertonic. There are lots of di there are different palpation uh, methods we use. We look for hydrosis, increased sweat activity. Palpate, compress. Is that uncomfortable? Yes. Whatever you feel there, um, I'd say give that a value out of 10, and they would say it's a 6 or a 5. I say, okay, for the purpose of this exercise, pretend it's a 10, and then I would position, I'd say, give me a score, give me a score, give me a score, give me a score, and by the time it's down to a 2 or a 3, we're there. Um, and then I'm, if it's a, um, a large area, let's say it is the, the trunk, uh, I might well um, treat 2 or 3 in the same way. But after each uh, treatment, I would say, okay, now let's go back and see, can you stand up straight? And if it's totally okay, fine. 
If it's only partially, then I'd say, okay, let's find something else and we'll treat it. It all takes, uh, each tre treatment, if you like, takes less than a minute uh, as a rule. So you know, we can afford to find several points. So uh, on the flexion, uh, locked in the flexion position, uh, anti-flexion, um, tender points are likely to be, if it's lo the lumbar spine is involved, in the lower abdomen, towards the, near the ASIS area, um, in the uh, lower thoracic, uh, upper lumbar, maybe uh, on rectus abdominis, somewhere in that area, we'd find areas of tenderness and we'd position accordingly, probably with a patient um, lying um, side-lying or lying supine. Uh, thank you. Can we do quick answer on that? Can we do strain counter strain as a preventive method? Um, I suppose if you've got uh, existing hypertonicity, then uh, before you um, before you go running or before you do anything uh, too energetic, you might want to release and relax some of the tissues. I teach many of my chronic um, uh, pain patients, especially those with fibromyalgia, to treat their own. Uh, anterior neck um, thorax area. Um, they wake up in the morning feeling stiff. I don't know if that's not so much prevention, but it's a bit of easing of the tissues. They can sit and release these different positions, different um, tissues. But if you've got something hypertonic, um, you can uh, modify it with position release, and then exercising is likely to be more, more safer and more comfortable. Thank you. Uh, from Raul, what are the contraindications of PRT? Heck, I don't know any. Um, you, you do, well, I do actually. Yes, I'm thinking of the introduction to the first uh, edition of my uh, position release book. Um, by the the um, forward for that was written by John McPartland, uh, who's an uh, osteopathic physician in Vermont. And John, in his forward, mentions. Um, treating a patient with a, a hypertonic low back using strain counter strain and um, he had not recognized that the hypertonicity was actually a guarding. So where there is a splinting or guarding, you don't want to release that, do you? And um, so you have to know the difference between something that's hypertonic and where there is an actual splinting. And if there's splinting, you leave it alone because he treated this person and um, as the person got off the treatment table, um, a disc herniated. So th there was a protective spasm and you don't deal with, you don't take that away. Otherwise, I can't think of many uh, areas, um, any contraindications really are, because it's non-invasive, because all you're doing is holding tissues in a comfortable position. It's the degree of um, positioning, uh, you, you don't create any new pain, nothing should hurt, the existing pain should be easier, is that's I can't see a contraindication. And we cannot end uh, tonight's session unless we give also an answer to Elias Tolos from Athens, Greece, where oh, uh, he is probably Calispera. <laughs> Calispera. So he's probably up at uh, almost two o'clock in the morning there. Well, uh, that's 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 normal in normal in Athens. <laughs> so uh, Elias is asking. Uh, do you have experience with using PRTs in uh, hypertonic muscles? Example, hypertonic pectoralis major in hemiplegic patients after a stroke and uh, their short-term or long-term effect, if any, in their function. I think when you're dealing with uh, chronic, chronic neurological problems, the holding time, we talk in, uh, in general hypertonicity, uh, we talk in 30, 60, 90 second uh, periods of holding. Um, my sense in uh, wherever I've treated people with any neurological dysfunction, maybe with Parkinson's or MS or something of that nature, uh, or post-stroke, that the the benefits are likely to be, uh, the holding time in ease needs to be many minutes, 15, 20 minutes. That's where I would actually use taping to unload tissues um, rather than trying to hold it in that position for any length of time. But I don't have a lot of experience of that. And I, I would investigate functional taping um, uh, if, if I were, if I, uh, if in your case, the patients that your your population, uh, you probably find that functional taping would be the best answer. But um, I know there are other practitioners um, who who do treat neu neurological conditions, and they would have more of an answer. I'm I'm not so much in that area. 
but lo the length of time would be much longer. Uh, Dr. Chato, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight for this uh, um, amazing presentation. Um, and uh, um, I would like to remind to uh, those uh, people who are joining us uh, from uh, um, either the United States or from uh, um, from uh, or they want to visit the United States that you will be on April 20th and 21st in New York uh, presenting a two-day amazing uh, PRT techniques uh, uh, seminar so uh, I want to thank you once again for participating uh, uh, in our webinar tonight thank you Dimitri thank for thank you for inviting me thank you for arranging it Thank you. And uh, uh, those of you, my friends, before we end, I would like very quickly to get uh, two quick responses from you. Uh, one is uh, this one. Please answer it quickly. Uh, um, whether you have taken uh, in the past uh, a, a course with uh, hands-on seminars. Um, let's see. Some votes there. couple of more seconds, I'm going to leave it, very good, and uh, uh, we have 64% uh, uh, of you uh, have never taken uh, a course with us, and uh, we have 21% once, and we have uh, some uh, uh, MCMT and CMT students as well there, and uh, finally, uh, I would like to ask you all how frequently uh, would you like uh, us to have events like uh, this? Um, uh, you know, we, we try to have a balance uh, so that these events, these webinars are well attended and liked by um, all of you. So your feedback to this is extremely important for us. So please vote now. Okay, thank you all so much uh, um, uh, for your feedback on this. And um, uh, again, um, uh, thank you for attending uh, uh, tonight's uh, webinar. And uh, uh, Dr. Chato will be uh, with us on April 20th and 21st. And for more information, uh, always visit uh, uh, handsonseminars.com uh, where you can also view uh, uh, webinars from uh, um, past events and also you can register for uh, new um, uh, webinars uh, such as uh, the um, uh, webinar on uh, thoracic spine mobilization with uh, Rick Schwartz and uh, the amazing uh, webinar um, with uh, uh, Michael Shacklock on clinical neurodynamics. So thank you all and uh, uh, have a good night.